All right. Gentlemen, I have two minutes after seven. We have 43 people that have, uh, that have come in. So um, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Hello, everybody. I'm Marty Rosendale, CEO of the Maryland Technology Council. And this is a special international edition of the live Capital M Zoomcast. With the Maryland Life Sciences Bioinnovation Conference just around the corner, we thought, it, we thought we would take the opportunity to look at why bio companies choose Maryland, and specifically Montgomery County as the premier location in the US. And interestingly, since the conference is going to be virtual this year, we don't have any geographic boundaries. And so we've been able to invite uh, delegates from all over the world, and we have quite a few international participants on our call this evening. Our sponsor today is the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. MCEDC is the premier public-private partnership focused on helping businesses thrive in Montgomery County, Maryland. The Maryland Technology Council is the industry trade association representing technology and life sciences throughout the state of Maryland. Together with our members, we are improving the business climate in Maryland and helping companies that save, secure, and improve lives around the globe. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items for you. Your microphones will be on mute. Uh, we will be using the Q&A and chat functions this afternoon. I see some people have already started using the chat function, so, so feel free if you, wanna, if you wanna share your contact information or, or other items, you can put it in the chat room. If you have questions today, I ask that you use the Q&A. Uh, we will be monitoring the, the Q&A function as we go through this evening, and uh, that way we'll be able to add your questions uh, as we continue with the discussion. The Zoomcast is being recorded and it will be made available for others to watch later to be able to find it on the Maryland Technology, excuse me, the Maryland Tech Council website at mdtechcouncil.com. So my guests today are Brad Stewart, Senior Vice President Business Development, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, a serial bio entrepreneur and the chairman of the Maryland Life Sciences. Stephen Walker, Senior Director Global Marketing Early Portfolio Strategy for GlaxoSmithKline and a board director with Maryland Life Sciences. And Dr. Murat Kalioglu, CEO and founder of Cartesian Therapeutics and a member of Maryland Life Sciences. Gentlemen, welcome this evening. Thanks, Marty. So, so why don't we take a minute and let, let each of you tell us about yourself and uh, give us some idea of your background and what brings you to Maryland. <laughs> Sorry, my phone is talking to me. Mm. Brad, why don't you go first? Sure. So Marty and uh, everyone, thanks for being here and I'm happy to be joined by our, our panelists also. So I'm Brad Stewart, as Marty said. Um, I've been here in the Maryland area. This is my 23rd year. Um, I've spent my life here, grew up in Florida, but spent my life here in Maryland. Um, came here post-grad school and have spent that time running a series of um, life sciences companies from pharmaceuticals, small molecules, to large molecules, orphan drugs, and most recently a global diagnostics company, which we did all of our, the company was headquartered here. We did all of our manufacturing here and exported the product to 18 countries around the world. So most of my time here has been running global life sciences companies. Uh, and for the last six years has been the chair of the Maryland Life Sciences Organization, really helping to uh, hopefully help companies grow here in Maryland uh, and on a global basis and um, really have a productive time here. Great, Brad, thank you. Stephen? How about your background? Sure, thank you, Marty. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, good afternoon and good evening and good morning to, uh, to everyone uh, that's joining us today. I know we have a global audience. Uh, so I'm Stephen Walker. As uh, Marty mentioned, uh, I work at GSK and I am the uh, Senior Director of Early Portfolio Strategy and Commercial Strategy. Uh, at GSK, I lead a group of uh, commercial um, uh, strategists that focus on uh, GlaxoSmithKline's vaccine portfolio. So we focus on the, the pipeline itself and assess the commercial viability as well as the asset valuations uh, for the uh, vaccine enterprise. Um, I've been a, a life science um, uh, business professional for over 22 years. 
I've had the uh, pleasure of working in multiple capacities and in, with multiple focuses. Um, I've had, uh, I've worked in small molecule uh, drugs, uh, large molecule monoclonal antibodies, and now vaccines. Uh, most of my focus has been in the commercial space in various capacities. Uh, some of those, uh, some of the other roles include uh, regulatory and general management experience. Um, I've lived throughout the U.S., but I've called Maryland my home for uh, for 15 years. Uh, it's been a great experience, and uh, I I call Maryland my home with my uh, my wife and two children. Stephen, thank you. So, Marat, Dr. Kalioglu, uh, I know that you've had some interesting news recently. And I, I've got some slides I want I want to pull up here before you introduce yourself. Sure. As you're doing that, I just uh, start off with um, first a, a big thank you to to you, Marty, for for organizing this, and, and to my uh, co-panelists for, for 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 doing this. It really, I think, um, speaks to the uh, the potential for the Maryland area in. Uh, in um, ensuring that the opportunities for companies large and small can, can thrive in here, both from a cell, cell and gene therapy perspective, which is uh, what, what my field is these days, from a vaccine perspective, et cetera. Um, my, just by way of background, I'm a physician scientist by training uh, and, and an immunologist, um, and uh, moved down here uh, about 10 years ago from Boston um, and started a cell and gene therapy company called uh, Cartesian Therapeutics. We're uh, uh, headquartered just uh, north of uh, the, uh, the uh, Washington, D.C., a place called Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, and uh, we're 20 of us, and we've uh, built a, uh, a fully integrated uh, cell and gene therapy company that currently has, uh, you can go to the next slide, um, five programs in clinical development in uh, oncology, autoimmune disease, and, and respiratory. Um, and our focus uh, to date has been to develop a potent yet safer therapies that um, are engineered with RNA um, that confer certain benefits. And you go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of a defined half-life and predictable pharmacokinetics that make them safer and yet still highly potent. We do this through a platform that we call the RNA Armory. We're agnostic to the type of cell we manipulate. So we have um, uh, two programs, Descartes 8 and Descartes 11, that are CAR-T programs that are engineered with RNA um, and they're safe enough to administer not only in relapse refractory disease, but also in, in frontline on, uh, cancer, uh, as well as uh, the first of its kind uh, CAR T for the first autoimmune indication that's currently in clinical trials for myasthenia gravis. Uh, when the pandemic hit four months ago, we um, uh, we uh, decided to go and do our part, uh, and, and the scientists at Cartesian came up with this idea of engineering into a mesenchymal stem cell, an MSC, a combination of um, enzymes that uh, when um, uh, secreted by the cell and targeted by the cell to the lungs um, are capable of chewing up nets. And nets are neutrophil extracellular traps. They're these sticky webs of DNA that um, are key drivers in the, in the pathogenesis of COVID-19 as well as ARDS. And a couple of beautiful papers just came out yesterday showing that patients' lungs, with, uh, if COVID patients' lungs are just filled with these nets. Um, and so our hope and expectation is that by administering these um, off-the-shelf uh, cells that are engineered to express a combination of these enzymes that we could uh, eliminate nets and change the course of disease. So, um, we're very excited at, at, at being at the prospect of doing that and, and particularly excited at the prospect of doing in Maryland just by virtue of the, the kinds of benefits that I'm sure we'll talk about um, that uh, a company such as ours just 
naturally experiences uh, by, uh, by its very presence in, in, in Maryland. Murat, thank you. Uh, first of all, that's amazing work. And the fact that you could pivot so quickly and get this far as fast as you did is, is just phenomenal. So, so thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, before we go on, I, I just want to point out to the audience tonight, uh, I know you're, you're using the chat function. If, you, if, if it seems like you can't see everything that should be in the chat function yourself, don't worry about it. We're going to record that and it will be sent to you later so you'll be able to see uh, all the information that's being shared in, in the chat room. Um, just quickly, uh, I'm going to bring up a little bit of my background. So um, I've been in the biotech space for about 35 years myself. I've been the, the CEO of a, of a handful of biotech companies, two of them right here in Maryland. I could have put either of those companies any, anywhere I wanted, and I chose Maryland for all the reasons that, that you're going to hear this evening from our panelists. So with that, Brad, I know you're also a transplant to Maryland. I, I came here from California. I know you came here from, from elsewhere. Um, you've been here for some time, and now you're, you, you're in a unique role to really understand and see what, what is available here. So give us some, some sense. Tell us about the life sciences space in Maryland, what keeps you here, and why you're so enthusiastic about it. And I know we have a couple of slides here for you as well. Sure. Appreciate it, Marty. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I, I have been here in Maryland for 23 years now and uh, was actually moved here by a, an international uh, global pharmaceutical company. It was based in Italy and had their U.S. headquarters here in, in Maryland and have been here since then. And it's a very interesting place to live, which I'll talk about some of those details in a second. Um, but to give people a little bit of an orientation to sort of physically where we're located and, and the sort of things that are here. Uh, this is downtown Silver Spring, which is part of Montgomery County. This is United Therapeutics headquarters. Uh, this area, Maryland's part of the capital region is, in, is the fourth largest biotech uh, hub in the United States. Uh, what people don't realize is there is a huge workforce here that's trained uh, in this area. There are 63,000 STEM workers uh, in this area. There's 18 and a half million square feet of wet lab space. And there's about $1.6 trillion of economic activity related to healthcare here. And if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a little sense of why that's the case or some physical orientation. For those of you who aren't from the United States or aren't from the Eastern part of the United States, Washington DC is about the center of the East Coast uh, of the United States, a pretty short flight to almost anywhere in Europe, five or six hours, depending on where you're going obviously a little bit longer if you're going to Asia. Uh, but right where we're located, Maryland is just north of Washington, DC. And you'll see from this map, um, basically where the thumbtack is, is where Montgomery County is, which is where I'm located and the rest of us uh, live. Uh, shortly from us is Baltimore. We're very close to Philadelphia. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, you see New York City and then just past that Boston. So. Uh, pretty central to the entire life sciences industry on the East Coast. And the next slide. So this will give you a little bit of a sense of why I've been here for the last 23 years, why I stay here, and what's so very intriguing about where we are. Uh, most people don't realize the impact this area has on the global life sciences uh, marketplace, uh, not only from a development perspective, but from a commercialization perspective. Uh, we call it the epicenter of global healthcare and life sciences. And to give you a sense of that, um, right here in the bottom is Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, as I mentioned. Maryland is basically to the north of it. This large um, blue-gray county, Montgomery County, is where we're located, which is adjacent to Washington, D.C. And you'll see that um, almost all of the largest organizations in the world related to healthcare are headquartered in this area. So up in the top right near Baltimore, uh, which is a, uh, has a significant number of life sciences companies, more manufacturing oriented and more of an urban environment. We have the headquarters for CMS, uh, which is the Center for Medicare and Medi Medicaid Services. They have a budget of approximately of over $1 trillion per year to pay for healthcare in the United States. And that is by far uh, not all the money that's paid for in healthcare. That is purely the money here in the U.S. that goes to fund the Medicare program and some portions of the Medicaid program. Uh, but they are by far the largest payer for healthcare services in the entire world. 
uh, at the bottom right above Washington, D.C., you see one of the reasons we have such a substantial workforce that's STEM trained, STEM educated, and where they have a stunning amount of expertise in cutting edge therapies because they're typically developed here. The scientists at NIH, which is the world's largest researcher of, of um, healthcare and life sciences. So they have an annual budget of $41 billion. Uh, their entire headquarters is here in this area. Uh, not only their main campus in Bethesda, but you'll see not far from um, where Marat and Stephen are located, they're uh, in about in the middle of Montgomery County, NCATS, uh, the National Center for Advancing Therapeutic Sciences, and then the National Cancer Institute uh, have headquarters there. And then um, slightly to the right of that, the Food and Drug Administration's headquarters is here in Montgomery County. Uh, their budget's about $5 billion a year, and as everyone knows, uh, they're the largest regulator of healthcare products on the face of the earth. Um, and so Stephen will talk about in a little bit sort of some of the advantages that come about from being co-located with uh, not only all these huge scientific resources and payment resources, but also these uh, regulatory resources. Hey, Brad, sure. you know, we've seen with COVID-19 and the, and the response to the pandemic, a, a lot of the money, the, the um, Operation Warp Speed, the other government money funding coming in, uh, about 30% of, or 30 to 35% of almost 20 billion dollars is coming into this region, uh, which is indicative of the tremendous uh, vaccine development and cell and gene therapy space that we've got here. But, you know, with, with so much going on, what do you see happening with, with respect to the growth? Where, where is the future going in this region? It's, it's an interesting question, Marty. There's a a good diversity of companies here, but you tend to see expertise and skill sets that get clustered together. There's a substantial number of cell and gene therapy companies located here in this area. And as Murat mentioned, he's a wonderful example of people who are successful in that space. A lot of times that has to do with resources and skill sets that, that are available, whether they're scientists, manufacturing people, or facilities. Um, so it's interesting if you look at Frederick County, which is just to the north of us, um, in the top left hand of your screen to the west of us, actually, that's where Kite decided to build their um, global CAR-T manufacturing facility. Uh, so they're building what will be their largest uh, manufacturing facility for autologous cell therapies there, um, not only for access to a workforce that has expertise in doing these, uh, but additionally, they decided to build their research and development headquarters here because the scientists to develop their CAR-T therapies came out of the National Cancer Institute. Um, you also see very interesting things that are here. Uh, Catalent uh, has a huge number of operations in the state of Maryland, not only in cell and gene therapy, but additionally in vaccine manufacturing. Uh, Catalent's got a division that's located literally right around the corner from Murat's office that he showed you a picture of. Right around the corner from there is AstraZeneca. So you have a huge, uh, uh, their biologics division, which was formerly Meta Metamune. Huge amount of experience in proteins, monoclonal antibodies. And then Stevens company, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, their vaccine headquarters here. And, and not only do they pro do protein and monoclonal manufacturing here on a commercial scale, uh, also their vaccine development. So I think there's a lot, particularly in those spaces, the cell and gene therapy spaces and vaccines. You mentioned the coronavirus pandemic and the response to it. Uh, in the last four months, there's been over $3 billion invested in companies in this region uh, for that pandemic response. Many of those are companies which are developing vaccines uh, for uh, the coronavirus. So Novavax is located almost adjacent to Murat's company. Uh, Emergent is has a fresh and fill facility across the street from GlaxoSmithKline where Stephen works. Uh, so you have a large number of these. And in the last two weeks, um, there have been two companies that are in the coronavirus space, which aren't uh, vaccine manufacturers, but are one's an actually a novel antiviral therapeutics manufacturer. And another is a company which uh, has developed um, manufacturing technology to do um, rapid scale manufacturing locally of products uh, whether they're related to the pandemic or not, have both relocated from elsewhere and decided to establish their headquarters here in, in Maryland, here in Montgomery County. 
Great, thanks, Brad. I've, I've got a follow-up question with respect to the, the government and, and how proximity to the government can be valuable, but I'm gonna let you uh, think on that a little bit and move to Stephen. Stephen, I, I've known you for a number of years now. You've been helping companies develop and commercialize biotechnologies. You're now a key executive with one of the largest local vaccine manufacturers. What is it about the, the regulatory and clinical development advantages of this region that any bio company should be aware of? Well, well thank you, uh, Marty. I mean, that's a, that, a great question. And I think the slide that you have up there is an excellent slide. And I like the, the language that is uh, that we're using here of, a, of an epicenter of uh, healthcare and life sciences. Um, although our discussion is focusing primarily on the life sciences, you know, when we look at healthcare, there are a number of uh, major healthcare um, uh, uh, providers in the area. So uh, I really like this slide of a, a of an epicenter, and um, you know, so so let's take a let's talk a little bit about uh, regulatory first, and then we'll get to the uh, the the clinical development side of things. Uh, Maryland is really. Um, serving as the host of a confluence uh, connecting our regulatory uh, agency, the FDA, uh, with our life science innovators. And the result of this are some, uh, some really powerful um, opportunities. Uh, when we take a look at the, the FDA, Brad uh, briefly spoke a little bit about the FDA, but um, it is the gold standard across the, uh, ac across the globe. Uh, with an annual budget of $5.7 uh, billion. It manages over 20,000 prescription drug products uh, at, that are approved for marketing currently. Uh, there are over 6,500 different medical device categories uh, that the FDA uh, manages. And uh, the FDA employs over 18,000 people. And obviously with uh, the FDA being right here in Maryland and Silver Spring, uh, there's some importance there. So when we think about that 18,000 people and we reflect on the fact that the FDA was founded in 1906, it infers that there are more than 18,000 uh, ex-FDAers walking the streets in the US and a large number of them are here in the Maryland area. And, and you ask, uh, well, okay, and, and, and how is that a benefit? It's, it's really about access to expertise. Uh, these individuals that are ex-FDAers are your neighbors, uh, are your friends, are the individuals that you work out with, you play golf with, they're the parents of your, your children's friends. Uh, and uh, it puts you in very close proximity to individuals that are in the know and understand um, uh, the FDA process and how to get through that uh, uh, regulatory labyrinth that, it, that, uh, that exists. My experience, as you uh, gave the introduction, um, you know, I, I spent some time as the uh, chief business officer of a consulting firm. Uh, my consulting firm was a, uh, uh, or is, it, it, it's still in existence, the consulting firm I was with, uh, focused on regulatory strategy and was an international um, consulting firm. Uh, we hosted uh, uh, international clients from 58 countries around the world. We focused on uh, the different uh, regulatory uh, subgroups within the FDA, CBER, CDER, and um, CDRH. Uh, many of our consultants uh, live right here in Maryland. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of them lived in, lived in Maryland or the uh, very close by areas of DC or, or maybe Virginia. And we had clients uh, all across the globe. Um, and we had uh, uh, the ability to continuously grow and to uh, ensure that we had a pipeline of talent and uh, expertise coming in to help our clients. Uh, the expertise was at no shortage uh, due to the high concentration of these regulatory experts. So when you couple that with the fact that uh, we have the organization itself, but uh, on top of that, Maryland is the host to over 2,700 life science companies that are interfacing with the FDA in some capacity. There's a tremendous amount of uh, expertise and knowledge uh, and familiarity with the, uh, the FDA processes from, uh, as I mentioned, your neighbors and uh, individuals right here in your, in your neighborhood. So 
Uh, I think that that's a tremendous asset uh, that no other uh, geography in the United States can boast. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, relocated, Marty, from uh, from California. I was here in Maryland for a while, and then I moved out to San Francisco, where I worked in biotech. Uh, and although that is a major uh, center of excellence for biotechnology, uh, there still was not that that kind of concentration of uh, of scientists and and individuals that had that regulatory background. So I think it it puts um, Maryland in a very unique place. Yeah. No, I agree, not, not, not only from the concentration of scientists and talent, but um, I, I spent half my life in Los Angeles in the LA basin, which is basically concrete and asphalt by 50 miles by 100 miles. Here, you can, you can live in Maryland, you can be in the countryside, you can be in the city, you've got, you've got your choice. And so it's not uncommon, in fact, it's very common for uh, FDA professionals, and the, their next career step is to step away from the FDA, stay in Maryland, but become consultants and help others, as, as you were pointing out. So, Stephen, the FDA has a, a cooperative agreement with the TGA in Australia. They have a confidentiality agreement with the MHRA in, in the UK. They're trying to cooperate with other international agencies. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what is it like for an international company to come into the U.S. and what should they expect that they're going to have to, to, to do to be compliant with the FDA? Sure. Uh, and that's a question that uh, uh, I've heard many times and people trying to gain clarity. So uh, one thing is that the FDA is working on a global basis to better harmonize uh, the expectations between what the FDA wants and some of the other um, uh, regulatory agencies around the globe. So if you look at the uh, uh, EMEA, um, and uh, what their standards are for uh, for approving products, uh, there is an active uh, effort to uh, to to have uh, greater harmonization in that uh, in that realm. Uh, other considerations, though, um, include uh, if you're looking to come into the U.S. First and foremost, uh, you're going to need a a registered uh, agent. If you do not have a location here in the United States, you're going to need a uh, an, an agent, uh, and a registered agent. And there's a, a a number of ways of doing that. As I mentioned, there's consulting companies that will set that up for you. Um, but essentially, that's going to be the first thing is that you have a, a point of contact here in the U.S. Uh, that will receive your uh, communications and be the interface for, for you with the FDA. And then you'll move forward. So whether you're looking at a um, uh, vaccine, a, uh, a monoclonal antibody, a biologic, a, a, a small synthetic drug, um, you can then start to interface with the FDA and you would go about um, your, uh, your, your pre-IND uh, conversations with the FDA and then you would move forward. So uh, having an established um, uh, residence or at least representative here in the U.S. will be uh, essential for you to be able to interface uh, with the FDA. Great. Stephen, thank you. So Marat. You could have put Cartesian Therapeutics anywhere you wanted to in the country, possibly anywhere in the world. Why did you choose to put it here and, and why do you remain enthusiastic about being here? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a few reasons there. So, um, so th this is our third company that we're, we're starting from, from scratch and, um, and and I'll speak specifically to the benefits around the uh, cell and gene therapy company. Um, although it's a case to be made that, you know, virtually any type of company could potentially flourish in, in, in this area for, for a few reasons. Uh, but in particular with cell and gene therapy, um, th there's number one, access to talent. We, we talked about that already. Um, so in our company, we have a significant percentage of our PhDs and MD PhDs come uh, from the NIH. Uh, we have folks that uh, have spent time with the FDA, as Stephen had, had alluded to. Um, and it, you have this ecosystem that uh, where you can draw 
uh, talent from beyond Maryland, uh, per your uh, comments from before, Marty. So we have folks that have moved from, you know, various states in the U.S., whether it's, you know, as close as, um, you know, P Pennsylvania or as far away as California, uh, and even out, uh, from Boston, uh, as well as international. So we, we, we have uh, folks that have moved here from international um, locations. Um, and, you know, to your point, I mean, I think um, I'm, I have a brother who lives in Mobile, Alabama, and, uh, you know, we talk about sort of the, 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 ben, the pros and cons of uh, recruiting to here versus over there and not to knock down all the wonderful things that they have going down there. But, but clearly we have that, that access to a very large metropolitan city combined with uh, this map that we're all looking at right now. Um, from a biopharmaceutical company perspective, uh, even after the, the company, uh, whether, you know, the company is acquired or, or, or goes public and you sort of get, go on your way for, um, to, to a different location, you want to know that you have enough of an ecosystem where you can make that seamless transition in your next walk of life. Um, and I think uh, Maryland has, has really cultivated that and in a way that allows uh, people that move here from, from, from elsewhere, at least in this industry, in particular in cell and gene therapy, to feel confident and comfortable that they have uh, you know, more than one life within Maryland in the context of, of, of biopharmaceuticals. So that's, that's one, is, is, is being able to attract and retain talent within this area. Um, number two is that you know, Stephen, you alluded to this, this power of informal networks. Um, there's a lot to be said about that, um, to have your neighbor and this and that to, to come from the types of both regulatory agencies as well as the, uh, your, your, your vendor partners. Uh, and to be able to know them in that context creates a lot of opportunities for a, you know, a, a growing entrepreneurial venture. Um, and those benefits, are compounded by the fact that you haven't yet saturated um, the area with this, uh, this sort of overabundance, if you will, of, 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 of other companies that are sort of trying to do what you're trying to do. So there's this Goldilocks zone of opportunity, at least in my experience, where uh, you really feel like you're reaping more benefits than if you were in say a Boston or the Bay Area where you have that sort of near saturation level. And then the sort of the third benefit of course as relates to that is that that's reflected in real world dollars in terms of you know cost per square foot um, and, and other benefits. So just I mean to give you an example um, when we recognize that, you know, we, uh, one of the key um, strategies of building a, uh, a successful cell and gene therapy was to uh, make it fully integrated. We recognized we needed to build out a, a GMP manufacturing facility. So we went ahead and, and did one um, that if we were to do the same thing up in, you know, in Boston, it, you know, I think we'd be looking at a cost that would easily be two to three X of what, what, what we ended up paying here. Um, so there's a real sort of uh, budgetary benefit in, and it's in, you know, as, as a company that is highly, you know, prides itself being capital efficient, that was, that was particularly important to us. Um, so um, those are probably the three main benefits of, of, of being in the area. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, time will tell, of course, that, you know, as, as we grow and, and, you know, additional uh, opportunities are added and additional companies sort of matriculate on to sort of the next stage in their uh, evolution and whether they're acquired or go public, et cetera. I think we just had a couple of biopharmaceutical companies uh, go IPO just over the last week in this area. Um, that sort of creates an additional stickiness in, um, in further propagating this, uh, this ecosystem. Uh, but it takes time. I mean, uh, you know, th this, is, this is work in progress, uh, as it is in many places. But I think Maryland has, has made some 
tremendous progress, especially I think over the last 10 to 15 years. Right, I'm gonna go back. Well, I thought I was gonna go back to your first slide. In your first slide, you had a photograph of your team. And it, it, and you've demonstrated that you've been able to recruit a top-notch team. They, you, you were just talking about the, the manufacturing uh, space, that, the GMP manufacturing space that you've been able to, to build out. You, you, that team was able to help you pivot on, on a dime to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so you've, got, you've got truly a top-notch team. What was it like recruiting that team from here? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the process of recruitment is, um, was, I mean, I, I have to say, it, it, was, it wasn't a, you know, I, I think people, I, I don't think I spent a lot of time ha having to reinforce the benefits of the ecosystem. I think people get it. Um, yeah, this information is obviously publicly available, and, and people understand, you know, a lot of the folks that have spent some time here um, sort of, you know, naturally communicate the, the, the benefits of the area to people that are looking to come here from, from, from whether it's a different state or even overseas. So that dialogue was, and, you know, our, our process of interviewing is obviously, you know, an extended one and, and multiple interviews. So it was through that communication with, you know, the, the, the prospective, you know, employee having that the, the conversation with our with our existing um, colleagues i think i think you know certainly you know certainly helped um, anyway yeah so that, as a short answer to your question i want to make sure that um, I, i'm not missing any any other part of that question no i appreciate it i just you know the talent is so important to a successful company right having having a, a diverse talent pool, having a skilled talent pool. It's just, it's just so critical to a successful company. So I just, just wanted to get some insight from you on that. Um, Brad, I promised you I was going to come back to you and, and talk about some of the, the governmental and, and, and legislative uh, benefit of being here. I know one of the things that surprised me when I, when I came here the, f the first time um, was the amount of time that I spent on Capitol Hill. I, I, I had a particular issue with the Department of Defense that I needed to get rectified. I, I was running a small company. They didn't want to listen to me. I managed to get our legislators to write letters. All I needed, all I needed was the Department of Defense just to pay attention. I, just, I had no idea that the, the value of being close to Capitol Hill, the value of being close to, to legislators was going to be significant before I came here. I think you're right, Marty, and uh, we talked about this a little bit in the regulatory context already. And one of the reasons when we initially thought about putting this discussion together was, I think in some ways we take for granted uh, the fact that we have very easy access to the people who are in government here or regulatory bodies or scientific bodies, and that we know them and can pick up the phone and talk to them or run into them when you're picking your child up from school or whatever it may be. It's this, I've had the similar experiences. Um, with the federal government. I've had uh, opportunities or challenges, however you want to phrase them, with the FDA, which I was able to uh, work through very efficiently through, you know, being able to interact with them directly and one-on-one -on -one rather than from an email address on the other side of the world. I, I think one of the things we all find is that um, business is personal uh, and that when you have actual relationships with people and discussions with them, you can find ways to work effectively and efficiently with them. Um, I've had issues like that, like you've mentioned, Marty. We had a diagnostic test at my former company. We uh, had gotten a new CPT code, which determines how these tests get billed in the United States uh, through Medicare and insurance providers. But then there's a process to get CMS to assign a um, price to that, the reimbursement rate for that. And that is uh, not a process for the faint of heart. Uh, but it's also a, a critical one for a company. Uh, I would say it's one of those you bet the company's survival on. And, uh, you know, we were able to physically go to, uh, you can testify at these hearings. You can um, provide written testimony. You can do video testimony. And for us, it was a 30-minute drive. Of course, we were there in person. Uh, we brought a, a patient 
uh, who also happened to be an attorney and a, a leader of a patient support group who had a kidney transplant, who was someone who relied upon our test to continue to live. And so you get very unique opportunities by that proximity to take advantage of the fact that you can interact with these human beings one-to-one -one and make those messages personal, real. You're not another email. You're not another phone call after return. You're a, an actual human being that, that they can help. And we find the same thing on the federal level. Um, even though CMS is a federal agency, you were asking about Congress, uh, the DOD and other places like that. So obviously a lot of the funding that has come through the last four months, the $3 billion that I mentioned previously, much of that has flowed through BARDA, uh, but also other parts of HHS and the DOD. Almost every one of those, every one of those companies has relationships with people here on Capitol Hill or at those agencies and literally spends time with them, making sure they understand their science, what they're doing. And at some point, people have to make decisions of faith, right? They have to believe that you and your organization can execute upon, uh, in the case of Novavax, who's located almost adjacent to uh, Murat's company, a $1.6 billion agreement. So you, you, you need to have that human to human connection. And then interestingly, the two companies I mentioned who've moved here in the last month uh, that are, do, are doing work, non-vaccine related work for coronavirus. Both of them were companies who've received, received funding from DARPA. Uh, so there are a lot of entities which are in this area, uh, which people regularly interact with, which are an incredible source of, of funding and opportunity. Great, thanks, Brad. Yeah, just, I'm just scanning through the chat room and, and the participants. We have a uh, good turnout. We've got uh, participants from Singapore, Germany, Australia, um, a lot of people interested in what it's like to do business in the U.S. and, and, and particularly from Maryland. Uh, Stephen and Murat, I'm curious uh, about your experience with the community. You know, it's, it's so important in a cluster like this that there's a community, right? That you've got executives helping executives and, and you know, c contacts and, and just a support mechanism, if you will. But what's been your experience with the community here, Stephen? Sure. So um, I'm glad you asked that question. It actually um, uh, flows nicely into something I was thinking about. So <clears throat> I think to your question, there's, uh, there's certainly the informal communities that exist. Um, there's also uh, organizations such as the Maryland Tech Council that has been a, uh, an incredible resource uh, for me personally to interface with a number of uh, other um, uh, 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 life science executives. Uh, when I returned from uh, from California and moving here to uh, to to settle down and uh, to to get uh, integrated into the the fabric of the the life science industry, I found Maryland Tech Council to be a a, a very uh, useful tool. Um, so there are certainly those things. Um, but what I was also thinking about was, uh, and it it kind of goes a little bit more to. Um, to part of the answer that you asked me earlier about the uh, the clinical development and why Maryland, um, Brad earlier spoke about um, the FDA and uh, the size of the FDA as well as he spoke about the size of uh, NIH, and I, NIH is the world's largest researcher, managing over forty one billion dollars annually. Um, uh, more than 1,600 laboratories conducting basic research and clinical research. It also uh, offers uh, pathways for, uh, for funding and collaboration and access to potential therapeutic um, assets and, and vaccines. So when you, when you think about, um, there's not only those, uh, those informal uh, meetings and collaborations and support networks, but when you take a look at NIH, the size of it, the magnitude and, and, and uh, impact that they have on um, uh, development stage assets, um, they're a great resource. There's two programs uh, specifically. Um, there's one, uh, Accelerating uh, Medicine Partnerships, or AMP, uh, in which NIH, pharma companies, and nonprofits, they work on new ways of identifying and validating promising uh, bi biological targets um, for diagnostics and new drugs. Uh, the NIH is also extremely useful for industry partnerships. 
Uh, we talked about uh, talent. So having access to expert talent and researchers. Um, there's also the ability to, uh, to partner with the FDA, uh, I'm sorry, with the NIH, and they will provide support until you get to phase two. Um, and then the collaborator um, that they're working with will have first right um, access to, uh, to license the product or not. This is a very, uh, a, a very great way of collaborating with world-class um, uh, uh, researchers, uh, as well as receiving some, uh, some funding opportunities. The last thing that I'll say about that is that um, the, uh, there's also access to assets. So when you're looking about, you know, some of the things with clinical development is number one, accelerating your development program, um, saving money, uh, and having exposure to innovation to ensure that you're putting forth the best asset possible. And when you take a look at what NIH offers, there are opportunities where there are assets that are available um, that may have been put on the shelf that you have access to. And these assets have already gone through preclinical uh, testing and at some, at some uh, stages, uh, even uh, safety testing, they may not have proven uh, valuable for the specific indication that they're going to, but they have already uh, 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 surmounted the, the hurdles, some of the hurdles, the early stage hurdles that you may encounter, which essentially allows you to save funds. Uh, so that when you're talking about the, um, the community, there's those informal communities that I spoke about earlier, but there's also those more formalized communities and, and industry partnerships that you can take advantage of and, 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 uh, and have access to. And a great example of that is looking at um, over 15 countries, right, companies at the moment are uh, in partnerships with NIH to find uh, uh, solutions for COVID. Uh, so, uh, you know, companies are able to mobilize quickly, uh, and this is just a great example of how, uh, you know, these, uh, these 15 plus companies have been able to mobilize quickly in a partnership arrangement uh, to fight COVID. David, thank you. Murat, your thoughts about the community? Yeah, I just echo what uh, Stephen is saying and just maybe add to it if there's a couple of more specific examples and just in terms of the NIH, we're uh, you know, at Cartesian, we're very fortunate and grateful that the NIH has issued us an, an exclusive license, actually two exclusive licenses around some foundational technology for our chimeric cancer receptor T-cell programs for uh, multiple pyeloma. Um, so those kinds of interactions are, you know, are clearly important. I mean, talk about... Um, you know, that having an asset um, that gets originally developed, you know, by NIH researchers and handed off to, 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 to uh, companies that then take them to clinical development and beyond. I mean, that, that, those relationships, relationships are very much encouraged. And the other uh, benefit is just from a, from a funding perspective, um, there are uh, these small business innovation research grants that are specific to, um, you know, the small biopharmaceutical companies um, and other life science companies that uh, are designed to get programs through into later stages of clinical development. So we're the beneficiaries of over $4 million of, of NIH grants across uh, two different disease categories. So, um, there, there is a clear support. Now, this isn't necessarily Maryland specific, but it's one of the benefits of doing business in the U.S. US in general. I, I do think that there are some uh, um, untangible benefits, uh, even in these specific examples of being a Maryland-based company. Uh, there's no way to quantify it, obviously, but, uh, you know, again, you know, human beings are human beings, and the power of informal networks goes a long way that are not necessarily quantifiable. Yeah, absolutely. So, gentlemen, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to cover today? No? All right, well, then let's open it up to questions. So, those of you that have been watching and listening, if you would Go, if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A section. 
and, um, and I will present the questions to our panel today. All right, so it, it looks like we, we have a question from someone who's either staying up very late or got up very early this morning out of the UK. That, uh, and, and the question, I think I'll pose this one to you, Murat. Um, you've had to raise money. Um, so what's it like raising capital from Maryland? I mean, the, the, the capital markets are global, but what's it like raising money from Maryland? Yeah, so this is, this is a topic we talk about quite often. Um, I, I think for, you know, it depends on the, the particular industry or segment of the industry. And if it's um, within biopharmaceuticals where the, the need for dollars is, is significant, um, you either have access to the private markets or, or the public markets, the capital markets. Um, I just gave an example of two companies. I, I wish I remember the name and you guys might know that, that were Maryland, our Maryland companies just went public or at least have, have filed to go public in the area. So clearly there is a real opportunity to raise capital from the capital markets as a Maryland company. And, um, and, and so, you know, a, a lot of the, 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 uh, the investors that, that, that invest across the board in these types of IPOs um, see uh, the, the benefits of, of, of a well-run, uh, publicly traded Maryland-based company and, and probably see a lot of the same kind of benefits that, that we do. Um, what's not talked about as much is the, the opportunities around raising private capital within Maryland. There are some terrific um, programs that are run uh, by uh, the, the state, the Department of Commerce. There's, there's uh, investment tax credits uh, that are given. We're the beneficiaries of, of these types of incentives where, you know, you, for example, up to a certain amount, I think it's a half a million dollars per investor, um, you know, it, half of your capital, half of your investment is returned back to you either in the form of a tax credit if you're in Maryland or if you're outside of Maryland, just as a check. So there is a 50% um, a uh, increase in the power of your investment if you're investing into a Maryland company by virtue of this program. Highly competitive program, um, and it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, I think it, it really helps a lot of young companies get up and running. Um, so it, it is a benefit. Uh, and there are other uh, other types of benefits that we just don't have the time to get into that are sort of run by the state. And there's there's other um, you know local benefits, accounting benefits, et cetera. There's all sorts of um, opportunities from that perspective. That said, the um, uh, we don't have yet a um, a critical mass of um, you know venture capital. Uh, firms that have sequestered in the area. There's a lot of angel investment groups and this and that, but from a, I, from an, uh, a large dollar VC based uh, investment opportunity, that's, uh, that's evolving. Um, and that's, that's an area of focus that I'm certainly interested in as both uh, an entrepreneur as well as an investor. Uh, and there are specific investor conferences that uh, are held to discuss how best to, to, to further improve upon that. Nevertheless, it, you know, taken as a whole, there, there is quite a bit of a, an opportunity just in Maryland alone and specifically, specifically within life sciences that, uh, that where, where you can raise sufficient capital to, to advance your programs. Brad, thank you. Brad, I know you've raised capital from the region as well. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting for us. Um, we'd raised $34 million in venture capital and uh, almost all of it came from outside of this area. So from our perspective, our responsibility was to develop a compelling value proposition and find investors who were interested in that. You know, I think one of the things about life sciences in particular is there may be arbitrarily a thousand venture capitalists in, in that space, but out of those, some of them are interested in different types of assets, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, or commercial products. And so by the time, if you are thoughtful about it and really narrow it down to that subset of people who are interested in what you do and understand the science, 
those people are going to be located anywhere around the world. As it turns out, we had investors that were located in California, Connecticut, um, Germany, Switzerland, uh, two of the largest, uh, uh, Roche was an investor of mine, Siemens was an investor of mine. So I, I don't, I think it, wherever you are, you have to develop a compelling value proposition and then identify investors who want to be successful with you and partner in that. And uh, all of them are happy to do so if you can uh, make that argument. Well, and, and I'll add, you know, we have resources here in Maryland uh, to, to help you as well. So at the Tech Council, for instance, we have the Venture Mentoring Service. So if you, if you need help with your pitch deck, if you need help understanding the capital markets, what, what they're like, how to address them, and, and you know, it's important to look at them as markets. So you, you're really marketing and promoting your company because you're, you're selling a piece of your company when you're, when you're raising venture capital. We have programs like our Venture Mentoring Service that can can help you with that we have we also have a business continuity task force that is is aimed at at helping companies navigate the current pandemic recession but but also uh, to help companies uh, grow uh, we've got tremendous mentors Murat happens to be one of one of the mentors in our venture mentoring service so you, you can tell you know the, the kind of caliber and quality of mentors that we have in the program and we have a number of other programs throughout the state and throughout montgomery county brad brad and montgomery county economic development corporation have programs um, to offer support and assistance as well so there's a, a lot of opportunity for that i don't think we're going to be able to get to all the questions i, I have one more question um, that I want to I want to ask and uh, Murad, I think this one is for you. It came in through the chat, so I can't tell which region of the world it's from, but um, it's making me believe that we're making a sound a little bit too easy to set up and, and operate a business in Maryland. Because the question is, what challenges did you face when you were setting up your business? Oh my goodness, yeah, it's uh, it's not for the faint of heart, and I think we all know that. Um, and uh, <laughs> Where to start? What challenges did I not face? Look, I mean, ultimately, um, you've got to feel comfortable with uncertainty and be able to uh, feel confident and comfortable enough to do things you that are outside of your comfort zone every day. Um, I, you know, through this VMS and, and other channels, uh, you know, the one thing I tell the, my uh, mentees is, um, don't get stuck doing what you're comfortable with. A lot of folks are, you know, it, it, coming from an academic science background, um, are very comfortable doing the preclinical work, but eventually you got to get to the next level and get a product to the clinic and then test the, test the uh, hypothesis in the clinic. And that transition can be very difficult. Um, the, the regulatory piece is, is always very difficult. Um, fortunately, uh, I've been blessed with having surrounded myself with uh, some terrific professionals, highly dedicated, committed. I mean, when the pandemic hit and we're all sitting around thinking, you know, what do we do? How do we do this? And we decided on this program I was telling you about in the beginning, boy, we, my colleagues work day and night you know, weekends, nights, whatever it took to, to, to bring this, this, this therapy together and lots of challenges along the way. But um, if you just keep at it, um, that's, that's it, to me, 70% of the game. You got to get lucky. You got to keep going. You got to be practical. Yeah. I, I, I like your comments about you've got to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable. I can tell you, I, I was raising capital for a small company in, in during the 2008 recession, and uh, we were out raising capital every six months. And I can tell you, I spent three years feeling very uncomfortable. <laughs> but you know, it's what it's what you have to do, right? That's for sure. All right, gentlemen, we're we're at the top of the hour. Is there anything that you would like to add? And and I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, like I said, we we will publish. The, the chat room posts um, uh, for everyone to see later on. Gentlemen, anything, anything to add? No? Okay. Well, I'm just gonna share my screen here. I know that many of you, I hope all of you are planning to attend the virtual Maryland Life Sciences 
Bio Innovation Conference. I just wanted to give you a, a chance to, to get a sense of what it's going to be like. This is a, a screenshot of the platform that we're using for our conferences now since, since we've gone virtual. Um, so when you, when you come to the conference, you actually enter through this lobby. From this lobby, you can go to the lounge, which is where the major networking takes place. And in that lounge, in the networking area, you can chat with a large group from the conference, or you can tap people on the shoulder and ask to have a, a private chat with them. So there's a lot of opportunity to, to chat, to network, to meet people. In the exhibit areas, you can go into the exhibit areas, you can talk to the exhibitors through, through specialized chat rooms. You can read their materials. You can download what they, what they have to offer into a swag bag, which you can do later download to your computer. If you go into the auditorium, that's where all the, the tremendous presentations are going to be. So you go into the auditorium, click on the main screen, and a list of the current presentations will come up. And that's where you'll, you'll be able to listen in and, and hear what others have to say about what's going on in, in the region, what's going on in biotechnology and, and healthcare in general. So I wanted you to have a sense for the conference. I know that most everybody is, is getting tired of virtual conference calls and virtual meetings. This is different. This is a, a really phenomenal platform that's aimed at facilitating networking. And, and in, in addition to this, I think, I think you all know that we're also using the bio one-on-one -on -one partnering system. So the networking starts well before the conference. Through the bio one-on-one -on -one partnering, system, partnering system, you can identify others that are gonna be at the conference that you wanna meet with. You can ask for meetings. Um, bio has added a new digital meeting room to their to their one-on-one uh, -on -one partnering platform. Uh, in June, when they, when they used it for the bio conference, you actually had to set up a, a Zoom meeting. Now you can set up a virtual meeting right within the bio one-on-one -on -one partnering system. So it's a very easy to use platform a great way to set up meetings with people and, and network throughout the conference. So just wanted to give you a, a taste and a feel for what the conference was gonna be like. I hope you got everything that you expected to get out of the presentation tonight. Again, I'm Marty Rosendale, CEO of the Maryland Technology Council. Brad Stewart, Stephen Walker, Dr. Murat Kalioglu, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a tremendous discussion, I appreciate it. Um, this will be recorded and posted on the MD Tech Council website for later viewing. So if you know anybody that you think would benefit from, from watching this or you want to come back and, and pick up on something that you missed, please feel free to come back and watch the conference again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Thank you.